Thank you. It's really good to be here. Uh, very intimate conference. Uh, I'll try to be quick. I'm naturally verbose, so I talk a lot. Some people call me verbose false. <laughs> but I'll try to be quick. Uh, like many of you who are from Africa or have some connection with Africa, I left Nigeria uh, to come to the US for college. And when I came, I said this in my panel, I had no intentions of ever going back. Got a one-way ticket, and I was ready to embrace the American dream. Prosperity, America, everything was exciting. I didn't go back home for eight years. And then in 2008, I started reading books on development and economics, and it really gripped me like nothing had ever gripped me before. Right? And so that year, I went back home for the first time. I was born in Benin, grew up in Lagos, uh, but this time I was on a mission. I was going to address poverty. So I went to a village, and this is uh, one of the first pictures I took. Right? You guys see a couple of women by the banks of a, a river washing clothes. Uh, I later found out that many people in that community didn't have access to water, and so this is sort of daily life for people. You go, you, wa you, you get water, the kids spend a lot of time doing this. And instantly I thought to myself, I know the answer to the problem. Raise money, start an organization, build a well. And that's exactly what we did. That guy in the middle is me, about 25 pounds ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, gone are the days. <laughs> Anyways. Built the well, felt really good about myself. If you've never done it, let me just tell you. There are few feelings in the world better than seeing water gush out of a well for the first time in a community where there's no access. Just thinking, kids don't have to walk miles anymore for water, I felt really good. I had a full-time job at the time. I lived in Wisconsin, and so for me, it was a resource transfer play, raise money, send it to Nigeria, get wells built, do some education investment. But then a few months later, I got a call, well was broken. What do I do? I got someone to go into the village, fix the well. But then I got that same call another few months later, and I got that call about practically every well that we built. And then I realized that model is not sustainable. I can't keep raising money building wells, and then having the wells break. And so I stopped. And I told my friends, we're going to stop building wells. We'll do other things, but we'll stop building wells. I initially, I thought it was our problem. Yeah? I thought, you know, just a group of passionate guys, excited about doing good. We didn't know what we were doing. I started doing research, and I found out it wasn't just us. Um, this was really a microcosm of the bigger development industry. There were hundreds of millions of dollars worth of broken wells in poor communities all over the world. Billions, really. But the research report I read said hundreds of millions, so I like to quote that. Uh, but my guess is billions of dollars. Because it's one thing to build a well, but it's, it's another thing to make it sustainable. So this approach in our research, we, we call it a push approach to development, where you go into a poor community and with good intentions, the best of intentions, we push a resource onto people. And it makes sense, right? Because if you've ever encountered poverty, just like the pictures I showed, it almost always shows itself as a lack of resources. You know, a lack of food, a lack of clothes, a lack of water, a lot of lack of education. And so instinctively, we are designed to push those resources to those communities to try to solve the problem. But we don't really uh, understand how the resources we're pushing are going to connect to the communities. And so a lot of times, these resources really are not signs of a lack of poverty or even prosperity. They're actually signs of more poverty. Right? When you go back home, for instance, and you see schools, do those schools really look like prosperity, like kids are prospering? When you see wells that are broken, when you see hospitals, 
Right? How many of us would go and get treated in a public hospital, perhaps in Nigeria or, or Kenya or Malawi? So these aren't really signs of prosperity. And so I thought the push approach isn't working. Uh, let's figure something else out. And so I went back to school, uh, got a business degree, and I've been doing research on this since 2015. Uh, shameless plug, if you haven't gotten my book, get one. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. They're outside, they're outside. Um, <laughs> I don't support Amazon, support me. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Hey, Jeff Bezos, I was kidding. Um, so this is, this is what I've learned about development. Um, the thing I, I want to talk about now is uh, what, what we've discussed in chapter four. Because over the past few years, we've been writing this book, and I learned something about the difference between pushing the resources we think will solve a problem versus creating a market that enables resources to be pulled into an economy. And I'll explain this by talking about Indomie noodles. How many folks ate Indomie growing up? All right. When you were eating Indomie, I'm sure you didn't know this was an integral part of economic development. <laughs> but here we go. So 1988 is when they started importing noodles to Nigeria. If you remember, in 1988, Nigeria was under military rule. We would not get democracy for another 11 years. Uh, we were a lot poorer than we are today, uh, per capita income of less than $300. Uh, about 80 or so percent of the population lived on less than $2 a day, life expectancy 46 years. So I would be sort of in my prime now uh, if I were living then. Uh, so you, 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 you get the idea. This would, Nigeria did not spell great investment destination, come and put your money here. But these two guys, two brothers, Haresh and Sajjan Aswani, saw the demographics in Nigeria. Instead of looking at the country and saying, uh, there's no opportunity here, and the best we can do is provide resources, they thought to themselves, like, how do we give people access to create a meal for themselves that's easy. Uh, that's sort of, that was their focus. Instant noodles were easy. You can cook it in less than three minutes. Uh, you add a boiled egg and it becomes sort of a filling uh, meal. So they tried to figure it out and they did, right? 1995, they started building factories in order to meet demand. But Again, if you've lived in Nigeria or you know anything about it, or Africa, you know we don't have infrastructure. So in order to build a plant, a manufacturing plant, they had to provide their own electricity, water treatment facilities, uh, wastewater systems. So after they did that, they say, okay, let's figure out how to get this product from point A to point B. Well, there's no UPS, USPS, FedEx, and so they had to build their own logistics systems. So they purchased a bunch of trucks, hired a bunch of drivers. Uh, in doing that, obviously, you have to hire mechanics, people that would fix these things. And then they said, OK, now we've got this. Let's, where do we store these things? I know warehouses. They built warehouses. How do we get the product from the warehouse to the store? Um, in my panel, we talked about informal retail. So they invested quite a bit in retail storefronts. At the stores, they could sell other products. So you see all the things they had to do just to get a pack of noodles, 20 cent pack of noodles from the factory to the plate in your house. And you realize all the things that this pulled into the Nigerian economy. This is one of my favorite slides because it shows over the past 30 years, all the things that just getting one pack of noodle to us has pulled into the Nigerian economy close to half a billion dollars in investment. They're now paying millions of dollars in taxes. Uh, they've invested in distribution, thousands of jobs directly, and in the supply chain, tens of thousands, are grossing about a billion dollars of revenue now in Nigeria. The last thing I'll sort of mention is how this connects to the ideas in our book, and hopefully it's encouragement for many of you who are thinking about entrepreneurship. When, 
we were doing research uh, for the book and trying to figure out, okay, uh, what is this connected to, oh, how is this connected to entrepreneurs in the US who would say built the US or in Asia? What we found is the activities that they engaged in when they were creating new markets to get products to as many people as possible were similar to the activities these guys were engaging in. You know, at the onset, when you're creating a market, you have to do the hard work. You have to do the hard work of vertically integrating. Um, and, and if you don't do the hard work of vertically integrating, it's incredibly difficult for you to build a sizable business that makes products affordable to as many people as possible. 1988, when they introduced noodles, many Nigerians, no joke, thought noodles were worms. Like, we had, that was in part of our diet, staple food, um, and they had to educate sort of the, the population, like, no, this is, this is good. And now there are 16 other players in the market, right, making and selling noodles. And this process of market creation, even when the circumstances are hard, uh, what we found is it's really at the core of many development successes. Good governance would help, better infrastructure would help, uh, less corruption would help, I mean, all those things, they would help, they're no-brainers. But, you know, those are things we can't really control. The thing that I think we can control is really understanding the framing and how sustainable development occurs. Um, and so my hope is that this is encouraging to many of you who are entrepreneurs or thinking about business. Even when it's hard, know that you're not only providing opportunities for people who work for you or the people who that your products are directly impacting, but inadvertently you are taking part of nation building in your own uh, home countries. So thank you. So we, we've got time for a couple of questions. So if you have a question for Fusa, please let us know. Make it a good one and, and uh, not, not a hard one. OK, there's a question over there. Um, uh, I, I love this story. I recently finished your book, and I super love this story. Um, oh, sorry, was, was it a good book? <laughs> It was a fantastic book, and I recommend it to everybody in the room. I didn't pay him. I don't even, I don't even know your name. <laughs> uh, you might not want to know my name after asking questions. <laughs> my name is Rob Fetter. I'm a, I work here in Energy Access. OK. Um, I feel like I could have told a similar story about Occidental Petroleum in South America circa 1990, just before, you know, or, or, or Chevron. Petroleum, you know, just before they had a big oil spill that resulted in a multi-billion dollar lawsuit. Also creates a ton of jobs, also creates a ton of extra infrastructure health clinics that they have to build because, you know, the, the infrastructure isn't there um, when, they, when they arrive. What's different between Indomie and Chevron? If anything. What's different between Indomie and Chevron? Um, well, so I've got a couple of minutes. Maybe I'll take this uh, elsewhere. I don't want to talk too long. So in, in our book, we describe the activities of resource um, extraction firms as efficiency innovations. That's chapter two. Not all innovation is created equal. And when you think about a resource extraction firm, uh, you're ultimately trying to do as much as you can to reduce the cost of, your, of a product to sell it to you know, as many people as possible, to the global markets the, 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 where you can get the highest cost. Right? And those are important, and they release a lot of cash flows to organizations and potentially to governments. Uh, but they don't quite drive development in the same way in terms of uh, creating a value chain uh, where you have to go from extracting the resource, 
right? Or, and in this case, it would be making the product, sourcing the raw materials, making the product, distributing the product, selling the product, servicing, and so on and so forth, right? Resource extraction, you extract and you essentially sell it to the highest bidder. And so the development impact is not as widespread as when you have to create a local market. Now, with regards to, and so that, that's, that's the difference between a, a market creating innovation, which is sort of what we call this, and that's an efficiency innovation. They're all important, but they really have uh, different roles. Now, when we start talking about Shell, Chevron, oil, th that, you know, the negative externalities are huge, right? Um, and so that is sort of, that's, there's, there's, some, there's something I like to explain is, um, if we focus on the fundamentals, in other words, how do we create value? If your society is not designed in a way where at the fundamental level is organizations that are creating value, and the value they're creating are now looked at by the government and they say, okay, let's take taxes and let's provide services, um, then it's really difficult to have a prosperous economy. And so a very fundamentally, right, you can't, the governments don't create anything, really. Um, they tax people who create. So their job is to make sure uh, Indomie noodles, Chevron, those guys are doing their jobs the best they can. And then they are now responsible, the governments, they are now responsible for making sure regulations and cleanups after oil spill happen, right? And so the, so the fundamental level is just ensuring that organizations are able to create markets, create value. Um, but we can probably talk more about this uh, off, offline. Uh, I don't know if I can take more questions. One more. Question. One more. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. Make it a good one. I'll try. Um, so you were talking, I, I caught the end, and I really like what you said about investing in a business or in entrepreneurship is in the state. Nation building and state building. And I think what really draws me to that, especially in terms of Africa, is everything we do or we want to do is to better that place, whether it's the entire continent or just your little small village. Anything you're doing is a sense of nature building. So my question is, I don't know if it's in your book, I haven't read it yet, but I will. He said, Mike, how are we nation building with the people here mm -hmm. and the ones on the ground? So like your example, you said when they first made the, the Roman, no one, Nigerians, I mean Africans, that does look like more. So how do you, how are we educating the people there to help us here nation build together because yeah. we can't as we can get all the technology and all the startups sure. here and take it there but we the human capital i think is so underinvested in, or is so underappreciated you can be the smartest person but if you have just you yeah. you're useless so how are we using the human capital in this tech world to nation build now, i think i think um I stood up after Bisa was done with her, her, her talk because um, what she's doing is exactly what we need to figure out how to do, right? She has this skill and she's democratizing it and empowering people. See, the thing is, um, when you focus on solving problems, and that's it, no matter what the, the problem is, you focus very specifically on solving a struggle, removing a struggle from somebody's life. Whether you use technology um, in sort of the Silicon Valley techie uh, way we define it, or you just introduce a, a, a better way for them to, <clears throat> excuse me, to make progress. Um, what happens is many people will gravitate towards your solution. And so an example we give in the book, if you think 20 years ago, um, cell phones were what we call a rich man's toy. And we look at the continent and we say, oh, of course, it's obvious, and we, we take that for granted. But 20 years ago, you told someone you were gonna provide phones for the average person on the street. 
they, would, they looked at many of the entrepreneurs and said, you are crazy. This can never happen. These people can all read. You want to give them phone. They don't have money. You want to give them phone. I mean, so many things were said. But an entrepreneur said, I'm get, I believe if people had phones, it would extract a lot of struggle out of their lives. And so he took the technology to sort of your question, right? Because he was skilled. I'm talking about Mo Ibrahim now. He took the technology and he created a business model that worked. In seven years, he was able to create a company that was grossing about $600 million a year, had about 5,000 people employed, 99% of whom were African, yeah? But that's not even the exciting part of it. Uh, the exciting part is, you fast forward to today, and that industry is now worth close to $200 billion in economic value, provides upwards of about 4 million jobs across the continent. Because when you create a market, just like Mo Ibrahim did, uh, like Henry Ford did, you invite other players to come in. And something that was impossible, ah, it can never happen. Africans cannot use cell phones, they're too poor, too whatever. We can't eat noodles, they're like worms. All of a sudden, you see, you see the effects. Um, and we know it's incredibly difficult to create markets. It's, it was difficult for Ford, it's gonna be difficult for us. And so part of our research is, now that we've written the book, how can we make it easier for people who are really trying to create markets? How can we spotlight these guys? How can we start connecting them to people with resources? Uh, because if more people believed this was the surest path to development, and if we made it a bit easier for them, honest to God, I believe we can eradicate poverty in our lifetimes. It's a framing issue. The resources are there, the money is there. We throw a ton of money away on useless projects that don't work. I built five wells, small, little small me, Wisconsin guy, five wells. You, know, you can imagine how many wells are being built, metaphorically speaking, that will break in six months. Um, and so my job is to make sure entrepreneurs get the resources they need so they can create markets and ultimately improve the, uh, life for as many people as possible. Um, yeah. But uh, I beg, buy, buy my book. <laughs> Thank you.